I'll, I'll begin by asking you to give us your name. And just, just tell us your full name. I am Jim Reuter of the Society of Jesus. Arthur Francis J. Bill Kreutz. Edmundo Martinez. Francis H. Clark. John Krebs. Luigi Moji. Arthur Andrew Bauer. Miguel Anselmo Bernat. My name is uh, Honesto. My middle name is Chavez. And his name Pagana. I'm Roque Angel Ferriol's Diamias. Now maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, beginning with your your name when you first arrived in the Philippines, and uh, your different assignments in the society. All right. So my name is Father John Krebs. I first came to the Philippines in 1956 as a scholastic. I studied in ph philosophy in Birchman's College, and uh, after three years in Birchman's College, I uh, taught at Xavier University in high school. And uh, then I went back to Woodstock, studied four years at Woodstock. Uh, then I was, uh, I was ordained after third year. And then I had, re I had uh, uh, my uh, tertianship uh, in New York. Then I came back here for language study in Mindanao and uh, studied at the Marino Language School <coughs> in Sasa Dabao. So after about eight months there, then I came, I was assigned here. So since that time, I've been here since 1968, and here in Bukidon. So I've been here now in this parish for the past uh, nine years. And uh, previously, I was in Dankagan for one year, my first year, and followed by 21 years in Kadingilan. So when I was in Kadingilan, uh, that was my uh, really first big assignment. So, Father, you've actually been a missionary here for all of your priestly life. Oh, yes. no? uh, perhaps you can yes, tell yes. us a little bit about the history of the works of the Jesuits here in, in Mindanao, specifically here in Bukidnon. You yeah, may well, want to mention some well, of the Jesuits you knew. No? All right. Well, if the Jesuits moved up from Cagayan years ago, that was back in around the uh, 60s, and many of the Jesuits were moving into here, or 50s actually, they started moving here. And uh, uh, Cagayan parishes were given over to the diocesan priests over there and also Columbans. And, uh, and then we took over here some of these priests, like Father um, uh, uh, Leone, I guess, was some of the missionaries, you know. Father Shea, Father Colin, they were the fir uh, first ones to really work here. And uh, they opened up a lot of parishes. So uh, when I first came here in 1968, uh, there must have been about 40 Jesuits, many of them still in Cagayan. But, uh, you know, we had a good group here. And, uh, and when the first bishop was assigned here, Bishop Clavea, well then we had, uh, say, about 40 Jesuits and only one diocesan priest. So since that time, we've had a number of diocesan priests ordained starting in the about 1980 was about the first. Father, were there, are there some, of, um, perhaps you can share with us some of the more significant events that happened in the past 31 years while you were here? You know? Some of the transitions that maybe the, the work here uh, underwent? Mm -hmm. Well, I th when I first came into the uh, district, uh, there were still many, uh, many new parishes were opening. And, uh, uh, I think it was uh, under Bishop Clavier that we first um, started having a lot of uh, problems with farmers and uh, 
a lot of uh, injustices. And I think uh, that was happening all over the place. There was a lot of, there were a lot of uh, landowners mistreating people and uh, there were a lot of cases in court, a lot of injustices in the courts. And uh, so some of us got involved in some of that work. I mean, you had to because uh, problems came up in your parish. And, uh, and so you started taking care of uh, those people, you know. So the, Bishop Claver was very good in that. He really, uh, you know, backed you, he supported you also. Father Cullen was in the just, in, uh, uh, take care of the justice department, you know. So uh, I think uh, that was one of the main works that we had. Uh, Bishop Claver was very interested in forming leaders. So we began what we call the Alagad program. And uh, those leaders have been very active ever since. And uh, they will help to organize people. I mean, not in a, I mean, not organize them in, in uh, say, labor unions, things like that, but just to organize the people in the parishes, in the little chapels. And uh, they were a big help to our parish priests. So I think that was one of the important events that took place here was the training of these leaders. Because right now with the small Christian communities, we really depend on these leaders. And, uh, and I think that's... Yeah, Father, in what way did you depend on these? How do you depend on these leaders? Well, because, you know, these, these are the ones, the, the people who really con have contact in the small barriers, because the priest can't be there all the time. So the priest depends on these leaders who know the people and who really work with them. And, uh, and they depend, their background may be, maybe they don't have a high school, even a high school education, you know. But they're the farmers, the workers, and they're the leaders among the people. You know. and and how, how has the training of these leaders, these alagads, shaped the, 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 shaped the church here in Bukhidion? Well, I think they, uh, they were the ones, first of all, who, who kept an eye on the people, kept, who united the people. You know. And um, they would, would gather them at least for prayer. Eh? prayer meetings, and, uh, and so they won the people's confidence, and uh, the people could bring their problems to these leaders. And then these leaders had their training from the central, and uh, so the priests knew what was going on in these places. And, uh, you know, that was, seemed to work well in, in many places, many parishes. All, most parishes, even today, still have a good number of lay leaders like that. Well, earlier you mentioned that, uh, that one of the main works that you as parish priest here in Bukidnon engaged in was precisely the work of justice for the people. Yes. Perhaps you can mention some of your own personal involvement, some cases perhaps that you remember, uh, maybe the major ones uh, that caused you know, difficulty on your part also. Yeah. Well, there were, there were uh, you know, people would bring cases against innocent people. And uh, so we would have to go to the courts, you know. So I don't want to mention any names, but I mean, uh, some of these people, a lot of these people are still alive. You know? But uh, it meant that we had to find a lawyer. We had to find out, and we frequently had to um, be ready to bail them out. We had to bring them to the court, Malay Balai. And uh, I still remember one time, I. I, uh, I felt that there was no, there were no just judges around here. I mean, the judges were crooks, you know. <laughs> Most of the judges were crooks. So you couldn't get any justice. Uh, the police, the mayors were frequently involved. And uh, these people were the victims. But as soon as they saw that the people had uh, help, that they could get legal help, they'd have a lawyer, they'd have, you know, th then of course they'd back off. And so, so we got involved, not that we were looking for trouble, but simply because the people trusted the priest. And frequently you had to go and be ready to bail them out. You know, people, the sheriff was already about to arrest them, things like that. And uh, so we then had to get involved in the case. And you'd have to bring, if you lived in a place like Cutting Elam, it was far away, you know. 
You had to bring the people to the court, you had to bring witnesses, you had to pick them up, and you'd get there, and then all these preparations, and then the case would be postponed. So <laughs> back again, you know. Then they'd set another date. You know. And frequently it'd be postponed at the, for the benefit of the other party. So, so even though they were the ones pushing the case and everything. So there were a number of cases like that. I remember one case where the barrio captain wanted to get rid of some, he was charging some teacher who had made him look, he said, he made, she made him look foolish. And, uh, and I think that she really knew that money that should have been used for the school was probably being used by the barrier captain. You know. But the thing was that he wanted to get her in trouble, get her out. Okay. So they prefabricated a case against her, brought it to the nearby town, and, uh, and then she had to go to, for the hearing. And uh, I told her, I said, you better get a lawyer. She said, oh, I can handle it, we'll, we'll handle that, you know. And the decks, they were ready to, they were ready to, you know, give in. And all right, we'll just pay the fine and, and give in. And so luckily she didn't do it, she didn't give in. Then she took my advice and we went to Father Colin, got a lawyer, bishop's lawyer, you know. As soon as the other side saw that there was a lawyer, that's when they backed off, see. But the thing, the problem that what always burned me was that the, uh, they just settled the case like that. They did not then say, well, the barrio captain had two witnesses who perjured themselves, you know. And that was just, everything was sort of dropped like that. But at least she wasn't thrown out of the teaching position and the case was dropped. But if that hadn't happened, she would have been out of there. So, simply because somebody she, there was some help for her, you know, she could get through that. And as a, as a priest here in Quidnon, you felt that that has been your role many times? Well, yeah, but I mean, apart from the ordinary work that you have in the parish, when those cases come up, when those difficulties come up, then you, you know, you get involved. Now, it's very different here in this parish. You know, here, you don't have that kind of... You do, you do have some cases, but I mean, it's not the same kind of situation. And, uh, what would be some of the challenges that you face here, Father, in, in Felix, in terms of your work? Well, here in uh, Phillips was, is a very d a different kind of situation. Uh, the main challenge here is to, you know, try to get the people involved. Okay? And uh, so one of the best things that we have here is the, the BECs, which are beginning now, and it's really helping a lot. Although it's still in the be it's in the beginning, it's not really developed yet, and we're still working on it. But that's a really challenge. And the people here are very they're hardworking people. Many of the people here are DMPI employees, you know, working for the Del Monte company. But uh, and they're hard workers, you know. so uh, to try to get them involved in the parish, and some are very good. Uh, the, the cooperative spirit, you know, I've, I've seen that work. For the, in your work as a parish priest, were you directly involved with work for the Lumans, for example, and uh, aside from the Dumagats, uh, which mm -hmm. team most Jesuits have work, worked for? Yeah, well, I, in Cutting Island, I remember trying to work. We had some Anobos on the border, in the border barriers, but um, it's very hard. I even tried a little to learn the language from one of my teachers, who was a Manobo Muslim, you know, but. Uh, it was very hard because you cannot really throw yourself into that. You have to really be there, stay with them. So, you know, so in a certain sense, the, those who are in the parish, well, they, <clears throat> they join your parish in those border barriers. And uh, here, I have one barrier. There are many natives out here in Dahilayan, but uh, they are, uh, uh, they're also sort of involved in the parish. And, uh, and usually they use Cebuano, and so you really haven't, don't have to use their language. I suppose if you really went out there and stayed with them, it might be different, but it's not a practical thing for us here. You just cannot do that. So they, they are more involved in our parish as part of the parish. 
and frequently they get a better education here. It's not the same as, for example, in Mirayan or, or in parts of Kabang Lasan where it's a little different. How does it from the two characteristics you mentioned, uh, the empowerment of the Alagats and uh, that's the first one, uh, work for justice. Well, are there mm -hmm. other features or works that you have more or less engaged in your uh, you know, assignment here as, as priest in... in yeah, well, I, I always, uh, going way back to Dankagan, where I stayed for one year with the late Father George Kirchgaster, uh, we got involved with the Corsilio. And in Karingilan, I had the Corsilio continuing all those 21 years. And there, even during martial law, when there were some very difficult years, uh, when people didn't like to gather and stuff like that, and uh, any groups like that in the church where there were always, uh, there was always talk against them by certain political people, you know. But uh, even then we still had Brasilio, and uh, even here we started that again. Uh, so that has been a helpful movement for us. Uh, I, th I think it's a good movement, just like the uh, charismatic movement. When I first came here, they had charismatics here. <laughs> And I had uh, some bad experience with other charismatic movements in Karangilan, uh, in some peripheral barrios. And uh, so when I first came in, I just said, well, I'll observe, see what they're doing. And I've been very pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Charismatic movement here is, is quite good. It's, uh, you know, the people are active. It's not a, they're not big groups, but they, they're one of the movements here. Yeah. And so I support them. You know. And also very active here is the family and life movement here. That's very good. And over many years here, even before I came, and before well, Father Moji was here, Father uh, San Juan, he had, had done a lot of work here. He still, he still comes every year. And they hold a family and life uh, seminar. And they had been doing this for people from all over the Philippines for years. So they would have a seminar for about, you know, 30, 40 uh, people, some involving some couples sometimes. And uh, they would have this training in family and life, which has been very productive, I think. Uh, if, if, um, if I ask you, would you be able to name one or two experiences which you feel have been the most rewarding in all, your st in the, all the years that you've stayed here in the Maybe one or two experiences which you find you know, unforgettable and very rewarding as a priest. Well, I, I would uh, I would have to say that my experience in working with the Allah gods has has been the you know one of the happiest experiences. I mean, just because there you are working closely, and uh, and they're really your right arm. I mean, they're. They're the ones that you you really get to know, and uh, and then you really feel that you have the pulse of the parish. You feel you know what's going on through them. I, I'd have to say that that is one of the best experiences I've had. And even here, we have the same thing here. It's still this kind of a experience. The Alagas, I mean, they they uh, they're active. They work. They're working people. They're farmers. And uh, yet they are the, the church. You know. uh, Among the Jesuit missionaries of whom you've worked with and stayed with, who do you, who, do you, who, do you, who are some of those that you admire the most and uh, or, or respected when they were mm -hmm. still here? Perhaps some of your heroes, you know, if you have them. Well, I guess you know, when I first came in, uh, I guess even as a scholastic, I remember Father Horgan, Greg Horgan, and he was in Impatog. He was a, he was here in Impatog, which is now called Baongon, and uh, so he was one of those that was very uh, influential. I think he had been. I had him as a teacher in philosophy in Birchpits College, Cebu. But then later, you know, it was just his way of dealing with people and and uh, his way of running a parish. I mean, he's a very kind person too. And then another one was Father Vic Cullen. Father Vic Cullen was the one who was uh, very active and very much involved in problems with, you know, uh, injustices and things like that. So he, uh, that, 
you know, even though they, they each have their own way of doing things, but that sort of, uh, you know, inspired me somewhat, you know. Another one, of course, is my good friend, Father Matty Fulham. I mean, really, he was, a, he was uh, with me for about 14 years, all in all, in King Elon. And uh, really, uh, you know, even though he didn't know the language, but he was, uh, uh, he was always, always there, you know, and ready to fill in and substitute and good companion for me. So if you're in a place like Cutting Elon, you're alone and frequently people don't go there unless they have a reason, you know, sort of added away. So uh, two of us work together very well, even though they were very different personalities, but it worked. You know, that was a great consolation to me in my work. Big help. Father, after all these years of being a missionary here, <coughs> you know, dealing with also also with the Austin priests, you know, mm. who are also doing work here, what do you think would distinguish, would, would make uh, uh, missionary work here distinctly Jesuit? What would be some of the features you think that would. Uh, because there's, all, there's a lot of talk now about evaluating this and that, possible and so on and so forth, as you know, being a director of work. What, what do you think would be an essential feature of, of missionary work that makes it distinctly Jesuit? Well, I think uh, to, so what we really want to do is uh, evangelize. I mean, we're trying to go spread the gospel. So we'll go into places that, uh, you know, still need priests to come in and begin the work of the church there. I think that's where we uh, were effective. But then, you know, we, we that once we build up a place and we figure that we're expendable, diocesan priests are coming, and that's one of the purposes we have also, is to have diocesan priests, you know what I mean? <laughs> when we see the diocesan priests ordained, we're very happy because that's one reason for being here. Right? And, and they, can, they can do a lot more, be yeah, much more effective, uh, because they're from this place, and they know the people better, they, they know the language better, things like that. Uh, so Jesuits, so we're not here, for, I suppose, forever. I mean, we're here for as long as we're needed. So when the bishop says goodbye, then, or we don't need you, then we would be ready to pack up. At the moment, we're still needed for certain places. And one of the special missions is the mission to the Lumads. That's the one emphasized now. And so we're ready. We're ready here in Phillips. And, Pangantuka and a few other places to move on and we have to. Yeah. But, so as Jesuits, it's more that, uh, you know, uh, initial work and then, uh, you know, starting, starting these places and then, uh, you know, training leaders, I suppose that would be a, another thing, really training, training these leaders, you know sort of characteristic. But I still remember Father um, Vic Cullen. I remember he had some of his leaders who were among the Manobos, and not Manobos, Bukid nuns, I guess. And uh, he's a very, he really had a way of training these people. Yeah. That's one area where we're, I, su I suspect we, we are very good at that. Father, as you know, there's been a lot of talk <coughs> about evaluating particular ministries mm -hmm. and in fact, one of the talking points in the last Congress was this pulling out of Jesuit missionaries from rural parishes, no, with the exception of uh, parishes that, that serve the tribal minorities, the indigenous mm -hmm. people. Well, what, do you have any comments about this? What are your thoughts about this, having spent uh, all of your priestly life in mission, missionary work in the Yeah, well, I mean, I think the main reason is that they don't have the men. So the, per the point is to... Uh, to uh, you know, to not commit any more men to these parishes that are set up, and then just to work in certain areas where you would need a limited number of men. But even as it is, we're not, we're, we're only getting, we're getting very few men, and they're not being given for a long time. So for example, they'll give somebody for the low months, but then they'll need them for something else, pull them out. Uh, and you know, personally, I, I still believe that if somebody goes into something like this, he really has to be 
involved in it, otherwise uh, he's just scratching the surface. And probably the bishop really wouldn't be able to handle these places uh, in the same way. So we can still be effective there and we can bring the support of the province to the Society of Jesus there. And I still think it's useful, we're still useful for that purpose. Uh, and then perhaps my final question. Uh, after all these years of uh, spent uh, working here in the Kidnon as a missionary, um, what would be some of your aspirations or things that you're hoping for or wishing for as far as the work here is concerned? Well, well I, I, I hope that, uh, I, I really would like to see uh, more young Jesuits involved in uh, the native, work with the natives, Salumat. I mean, I would like to see more men, even though they say, well, we don't have the men. I, I still would like to see uh, more men assigned, even though we say, oh, they need the men in the schools and they need them other places. And, uh, uh, and that they would, you know, really be committed then. I mean, they would send a man in and he'll work with the Lumads here and, and the bishop would know that this is, the Jesuits are working, this is something that the Jesuits can do and they can help us a great deal here. And that would continue then, it's not something that, well, you know, these people will be here and, uh, for a year and two years and then they come out. And pull them why, out. why do you consider this work with the Lumads? as a valuable contribution to Jesuits? Well, because I think that uh, we would be willing to go into this work and spend some time with these people. Uh, I think otherwise they may be neglected. You know, they might be neglected. I mean, uh, uh, there would be nobody going in there. And precisely because the diocesan priests that we get, we don't get that many. So, they, you cannot just have one diocesan priest in this big parish. You, you have to have several in some parishes. There's a lot of things to do. You can't just cover the bases. You have to, there has to be some development of the people and, uh, you know, working. So even if you just take the BECs and working with these BECs and the Alagats and leaders, you, you really have to get into that. You get to know the people better. Otherwise, you just have a big parish and one man. That's overwhelming. It's too much. So you might you may end up with parishes where you have two or three men, you know, priests, and they can give you know spell each other. I mean, uh, get a break once in a while, things like that. But I would say that uh, we still make we still have can make a good contribution in those particular areas where the little ones are. But maybe my final question is: uh, after all these years of working here. Um, uh, do you have anything else to add, you know, as far as uh, what it means to be a Jesuit or what it means to be a missionary? Here in well, I, <laughs> I think uh, you're just willing to serve, you know, in a place like this. Then you're willing to throw yourself into it. That's what I did when I first came. I, I went to work with somebody and I observed how he ran the parish. And I try to follow in that way. And uh, I think as long as you're generous in you know, serving the Lord and you follow the directives that are given, you'll find many wonderful experiences. You know, the people you work with, the people that you... I mean, I, I worked with sisters also for many years in uh, Karigilan, very good Assumption Sisters. That was their first mission also here. And I think it was a very good experience for all of us. Um, I, I think that's you sort of have to be willing to, to uh, you know, get into that. I mean, uh, throw yourself into the work, and, so, and then take what comes. Uh, you may not, you know, sometimes you may get sick, you may uh, fail, you know, <laughs> things don't work out the way it, they should, or you think they should, but uh, that's the way it is. You know. I mean, and you'll be happy with that. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't expect to go to Cutting Island. I was supposed to go someplace else. I was assigned to go to open up the first parish in Kiburiao. But then uh, Father Flores came and said, John, he said, Father Coley, he's in Cutting Island now. He would like to go to, to Kiburiao. He's, 
So I said, yeah, that's okay. Well, if he wants to go to Kiboreal, he has more experience. I don't have much experience here, so if he really likes that, he goes to Kiboreal and go to Cutting Island. Right? So <laughs> that just by doing that, and then I was there 21 years in Cutting Island. <laughs> I never expected that, you know. But that's what happens. So I was happy in that work there. And then after 21 years, it was, they decided that I should come here. I really didn't want to come to Phillips. And I said, well, that's already a developed parish. You know, you got the MPI there. I didn't really care that much for But then, uh, now I'm here nine years. So. so, happy with this kind of work. And if they say tomorrow, pack up your bags, I'll go. That's all. Period. <laughs> and I think that's what we should be ready to do. Eh? So I don't know what's in store, but I mean, I'll be ready to, when they say go, you go. That's all. Uh, Happy. Last question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've had some difficulties during your, your work, you know, your mm -hmm. stay here. So what were some of them and uh, how did you manage to persevere and survive? You mean in Cutting Elan and yeah, here yeah, also? In your work, yeah, Cutting Elan basically. Well, I guess uh, uh, in Cutting Elan, one of the big difficulties was always, you know, reaching the different places. So there was a lot of hiking involved, and uh, you could use the jeep so far, then you had to hike, or then we got, I remember getting horses for a while, and the falling off the horse enough uh, times, and then back riding on a motorcycle, and falling off that a number of times, you know. And uh, so just that, physical effort, that, that was hard, you know, I mean, and that was day in, day out, I mean, you go out to the barrios, uh, for, so in the beginning I used to go out to a barrio, and uh, or hike for three or four hours, then get out there, and have the, ba the masses, the baptisms, marriages, and everything like that, then you eat a quick supper, a dinner, you know. Yes, uh, so when I first went to Cutting Island, the, the main difficulties really were getting into the barrios. So we had to hike a lot, and uh, we we'll use the. Uh, after a while, I had to use horses, then uh, back ride on a Honda, uh, and uh, we had a jeep which had a winch and everything like that. So frequently, uh, that was the big problem, and uh, and then naturally, uh, you're going to pick up some sickness. So I had amoebiasis and trouble like that, you know. Uh, so that slows you down a little bit, you know. But you know, you, you take that in, as part of the course that you're gonna, if you don't, uh, you, you know, you drink the water and stuff like that, you might get overworked. So uh, that's part of it. That's what I found as, it's difficult, it was a challenge, but you, know, you take that in stride and fortunately I was always able to get back and continue the work. And that's where what I said before, Having Maddie Fulham as a companion, that was a big help because you know he he was always ready, you know? and, and he was already in his seventies and eighties then, you know? and he was still willing. He'd, he'd go out and hike every once in a while. <laughs> he would hike with his black shirt and his Panama hat on and hike out to some far barrio, you know, be willing to do that. So. So those were the things. I think there was a lot of physical, physical demands, you know. So you'd feel you know, you're tired, exhausted. And uh, so it was always nice to get out, to go to the Superior's house or the Bishop's house or someplace and just go to Xavier University and just plop out, plop down for a few days and relax, you know, you needed that. Were you ever discouraged? Did you ever feel discouraged because of the reception or lack of reception of the people? Or? Did you always feel that the people were warm and receptive? Well, yeah, in general, yeah. The, uh, there were, of course, there were some people didn't like me, you know. I mean, uh, but those were usually the certain politicos and people like that. But in, in general, I always found the people, if you're willing to visit them and you're willing, willing to be there with them, and they know that, so they know that. I remember when I first started in Cutting I remember Father Moji, was my predecessor here. He said, he said, just visit the barrios regularly, you know, try to, that's very important. And I did that, I always, 
I'd go out, come back, then later I'd stay out because it was too much to go out and come back. So I would stay out for three days, four days, sometimes five days. You make bio bio, you know, you go around and uh, sleep wherever you sleep. Uh, later I had a few chapels where I stayed. I could stay there, it was more convenient. And, uh, and then the people always take care of you. You don't have to worry about anything. So that was my my sistema, you know. Everybody, everybody has his own sort of way of doing things, you know. And I used to like to go out always with like a team, you know. I'd have I'd have with me some Allah gods, you know. and then so we'd have a group that would go out. And uh, even sometimes when we used the horses, to have a few of us, and uh, and that always had a better. That was always more encouraging too. You had somebody to talk with. That's how I learned the language better, also. You're always, that's, you're always using language then. I have no more questions. Anything else you want to add mm -hmm. to the interview? Any know. other insights or that you'd like to share? Well, just, just that, you know, if, uh, uh, I still hope that they continue. And I believe it would be in the Lumad area, you know. And, uh, Actually, what we're talking about is mainly the younger men because there are only a couple of us older men who are still here, who are still active, you know, in the parishes. And uh, so uh, the younger men who would still be involved here, I think it would be, it's a good, it's a good uh, uh, apostolate for them. And uh, it's also a... Uh, you know, I think some of them see that, some of the young men now working in there, even those who will be going to studies, uh, it's a good experience for them. So it can still be exposure for some men, you know, they would at least be there for a year or one or two years. But there should be several that would be more permanent and would continue the work. Because that's the only way they're going to become proficient in the language and the culture of the people. They would really have to stay for a longer time. Okay. And that's, that's the main thing. Thank you very much, Father. Yeah. Thank you for okay, the Okay, you're welcome. Thank you.